Okay, so welcome everyone to our panel discussion on pioneering disruptive change to create a zero textbook cost course with our three panelists from Southern Cross University who we're very happy to have here and I'll introduce them in a sec. This forms uh, part of our monthly webinars on a gauntlet of different topics. If you haven't met us before, we're a friendly bunch of folk called the Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group of Ascolite. And our community is a diverse rainbow and includes educational technologists and designers, librarians, academics, school teachers, and more. Apart from our webinars, we meet once a month to connect with each other uh, in a, a separate uh, meeting, and we share our current practices, how we're tackling different problems, and share resources. That's sort of like a working meeting. And once a month, we put out the OEP Digest, which is a 360 degree wrap of all things open education in Australasia, uh, including the newest open textbooks fresh off the press. So I'm going to make a shameless pitch that you can get this emailed straight to your inbox and hear about these events by signing up on our website, which Ash has chucked in the chat already. Um, and here's a cheeky snapshot of some previous webinars for the year we've done. And yeah, I encourage you to get on our YouTube channel, check out the topics we've covered over the last few months. A lot of them are quite related to today's topic. Before we go any further, I want to recognize that our webinar is being held on the lands of many different First Nations lands. And I'm personally working on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and acknowledge them as traditional owners. And I want to pay my respects to the elders past and present, and especially in the university context, you know, recognizing the First Nations contributions to centuries of diverse knowledge systems. This is an artwork of Bunjil, a created deity in Indigenous mythology who often takes the form of a wedge-tailed eagle, and it was painted by Wurundjeri woman Judy Nicholson. I'm pretty stoked to introduce our panellists today. First, we've got Dr. Desiree Kozlovsky, and she's a pleasure researcher. Uh, a term I haven't heard before, uh, and a senior lecturer at Southern Cross University. She was the course coordinator for the Bachelor of Psychological Science for three years from 2020 and led the total redesign of that program ahead of the new course for 2023. And a key feature of the new program is that it's paid textbook free, uh, an equity initiative that's at the forefront of the global shift towards OER. So you'll hear more about that today. Uh, we've also got Carly Daly, a librarian supporting the Faculty of Health, also Southern Cross Uni. Uh, when she encountered OER for the first time, she experienced an immediate click with her personal values, and she then started a deep dive into open at SCU and began to engage in advocacy activities around it. And like many librarians in the open space, Carly's really passionate about access to knowledge and inclusivity for everyone. And last but not least, we've got Claire Thorpe, who's the Director of Library Services at SEU, and she's used evidence-based approaches to implement user-centered innovations and digital transformation at several institutions. She serves on the board of the uh, Australian Library and Information Association and the Executive Committee of Open Access Australasia. And she's really committed to empowering a culture of openness in education and research to enable equitable and perpetual access to knowledge for our communities. Lastly, uh, we, well, I said last but not least, but anyway, we've also got Ash Barber from Uni of SA, who will be uh, chairing the panel. But first, let's set the scene for this a little bit. Um, if I can ask uh, Desiree, followed by Carly, to just uh, yeah set the scene, give us a brief intro about the project. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hi, everyone. It is really heartwarming to see so many people. Um, well, I'm inferring that you're all keen for this kind of movement, and it's really exciting to talk with you about um, what we've um, managed after lots of tears and tantrums and excitement to achieve in the Bachelor of Psychological Science here at Southern Cross University. Um, as Stephen mentioned, we uh, have gone uh, paid textbook free uh, 
uh, from this year across all of our core units. And indeed, if students enroll in what I'm going to call their normal enrollment, which is our kind of extension units as well, they will um, have 20, a minimum of 22 out of 24 of their undergraduate units will be paid textbook free. So, of course, they can take an elective that might have a $500 textbook. I don't know. <laughs> and alas, I'm not in charge of everything, but Claire's onto it and Carly's onto it. So hopefully they're not going to do that. But what that means is literally hundreds of thousands of dollars will stay with those, those students and their families over the next three years. And that's just our commencing cohort this year, our first years. So it's something that has sort of tur turned from a, a really personal view into something that's now getting systematic. And I think um, from the Southern Cross panelists here today, you have a bit of everything. I am like totally uninformed and just driven by the passion to make a difference to a cohort of students who uh, many of them are first in family. We have a very high proportion in, in psychology and across the university who are registered with you know, access and inclusion. We have mostly students with a whole bunch of other um, demands on their time. So they are seriously doing the juggle. Lots of our students have two jobs families you know so so we're not talking about you know a, a very privileged bunch of students so that's where my thinking arose from and then to you know we have Claire and Carly who who've got that much more you know literature informed view so they can tell you much more about how this works mine's just a kind of knee-jerk thing um, so I haven't assigned a paid textbook in any of my units since about 2016. It may have been earlier, but it definitely was at least by then. Um, this was definitely an equity kind of thing. I saw too many students that weren't able to purchase the textbook. The textbook that I used to use in one of my units was $180 back then. Um, so that was fine. But then when I became course coordinator in 2020, and this might be a hint for everyone, um, uh, I, I invited a student back, a graduate back to talk to our first years about, you know, what they had been doing, all kinds of exciting things. And as part of that, just incidentally, they disclosed that they had never been able to afford a single textbook during their undergrad degree and what a difference that had made to them and added burden to their studies, which was already, you know, quite burdensome given the things that they were they were juggling. So, and here's the hint: is I just thought to myself, no, I'm course coordinator. Who's going to stop me? <laughs> I'll just be like this megalomaniac <laughs> and and try and make this thing happen. And that was in the beginning of um, 2020. And I put it to the psychology team and look, I'm not going to lie, there was some resistance. In principle, I think pretty much everyone, we're talking about a team of about 14 or 15 people, pretty much everybody could get on board in principle, but there were probably eight or nine of those people who thought, yes, in principle, this is great but my unit should be an exception because my unit really needs the textbook because my unit's really important and really hard. So that was kind of the beginning of the journey, if you like. But, you know, cu cutting to the end, because I don't want to talk too long, um, we did it. And all of the units are without a textbook. Full disclosure, there are a couple of unit assessors who have said to me, I am not sure my unit's as good without a textbook. I suspect it probably is, um, but th that's sort of where we've landed right now. And it is exciting and students are terribly, you know, grateful for that. They do feel the difference. Um, I'm not sure actually if it's been a kind of a, a marketing point for us. We, we were too busy doing it to really talk about the fact that we were doing it. So I think that's just starting 
to kick in in now now that I've I've stepped down as course coordinator and thought hey we've done it you know it's it's that that's where we are so thank you Thank you, Desiree. Um, that's a pretty awesome introduction to um, the last, I guess, six to seven years for you in that space. Um, and I think from the outset, I'll say that this kind of thing can't be achieved at, at this point without this kind of champion um, to make it happen because there's a lot of resistance as Desiree mentioned, um, people are wedded to their texts. They their unit learning outcomes are, uh, are enmeshed with their texts, and Desiree managed to sort of shift that really sticky culture around um, um, commercial textbook dependence. So um, I got lucky in that in that sense, you know, of of working with somebody um, who was just very innovative and um, very student-centred, I would say. Um, from the library's perspective, I, um, from, the, from SCU's perspective, we sort of started to get into this space um, when we attended the QLOC Summer Institute, which was, I think, back in just before COVID hit, so it was 2020 or something like that. Um, and I was lucky enough to attend it with my supervisor at the time, um, Robbie McFarlane. I was already really um, passionate about open education and I was like, please pick me, pick me to go on this, um, this sort of journey um, up to um, USQ. And that was just a bit of a flick of a switch for me. It sort of really accelerated my knowledge of OER. Um, helped me sort of make connections so that and those connections have kind of continued on um, so building that community um, we listened to a, a speaker from the US talk about um, the open textbook library and we all got together and really sort of hashed out strategies on how to um, how to advocate for OER in this kind of climate where academics might be quite resistant to changing. Um, they may even have listed the textbook as that they had authored as the as the key text. So we went through a range of scenarios and how we could, um, you know, pitch this idea to academics who, who may be resistant. Um, so I spent a lot of time doing that, but during the Institute, I honed in on the psychology textbook, the OpenStax textbook, and, and sort of went, aha, this is like a, a core text for first year psychology. And the first person that popped into my mind was Desiree. I had met her, I don't know, maybe a couple of months before that, like when I first moved to um to um SCU and had a, a an immediate click with her in terms of our alignment with what how we approach teaching and learning. Um, so she, I, I have to disclose that I got so lucky because she was the first person that I pitched OER to. And as you can see, that there, there was a lot of serendipity in that. Um, but at the same time, there was this identification that she's an innovator in that space and her values are aligned with the values of the open education movement. So I think that's a key part in, ter in terms of identifying academic champions for librarians is like working out who are, who are those who are those academics that are student centered and want to innovate and and can go down that path. So when I sort of came to um, Desiree, who obviously had all, already been a disruptor and a change agent for many years, um, it was just like, yes. You know, it was quite, um, you know, let, let's, I haven't had a textbook for six years or seven years or whatever it was. Um, let's have a look at this text that that could um, align with the unit that I'm working with. And I think it was, I've got to remember, we've got to get it up on the screen. It was research methods in psychology. Um, and I don't know which, there's many editions of that text, but I think it was the American edition at the time. And that got... That got a lot of usage, so we were able to track that through our Primo um, catalogue. 
And I should also mention that when I came back after that institute, we'd already been working on this plan to sort of mimic um, what um, RMIT had been doing in the space to create a special collection with Primo and to, to map um, key texts to our faculty areas. So we were working on that um, midway through that. Um, so, yeah, Desiree was just really open to, to that. Um, and then it became a sort of, you know, four-year four conversation from the library's perspective in terms of Desiree's doing all that hard work in, in you know, changing minds and approaches to teaching and learning. Um, and um, along the way, it was sort of conversations with other UAs. Where, and if I look back, there were varying degrees of resistance. There were some people who were just like quite um, a bit cynical, I would say. Is that the right word to use, Desiree, or a little bit sort of that be the right word? Oh, there's a lot of words, Carly. There's, yeah. There's cynical, there's terrified, there's infuriated, there's, you know, yeah, there's tenuously quite... supportive. Yep. Yep. So I would, so while I got lucky with Desiree in the beginning, it was then after that was meeting with these various UAs. Um, and this was happening during COVID, those initial meetings. So everyone was, was a little bit topsy-turvy at that time. Um, but also there was, there was that sort of focus on digital access. So it was harnessing that conversation around access to digital resources that people couldn't people couldn't easily get access to their reserve copies in libraries. So there was this sort of opportunity to, to accelerate that conversation around that time. Um, and then talking to, to discipline meetings. Um, and I think at some point, I think Claire and I spoke with them um, together, spoke with the Dean of Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Health. So there were, you know, it's kind of like what, um, I think it's Lambert and Fidel in the scoping study from last year talk about that sweet spot of lots of levels and lots of conversation, that sweet spot between the ground liaison in those conversations that you're having and then also sort of faculty meetings and policy and procedures and, 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 and institutional um, sort of influences as well. So it's been um, uh, an ongoing conversation um, and it's it's just been honestly the most exciting thing I've worked on as a librarian in my whole career because it's just been um, this alignment with my values and working with someone like Desiree and um, being able to sort of show that it's possible. Um, and, and as Desiree mentioned, you know, we don't want to talk about this as if it's like some sort of unicorn because in the mix of it is that that not every text, not every unit was able to be met, met with an open OpenStax OER text. We know this. There just isn't the content in the Australian landscape for that just yet, although some of that's changing. There's been a couple of extra um, titles published recently, but there's always those, those areas of Australian law or, or, or that Australian-specific content um, that is just not quite matching some of the unit learning outcomes. So... I think there's one unit in the program that re relies on um, a new term that I learned the other day was inclusive access. So it, it relies on a, a commercial textbook that gives um, unlimited access to students. So we do pay for one text um, in, in, in across that program. So I think it's really important to be realistic about that as well. Um, but... Um, it's an ongoing process and an ongoing conversation. I think it's got, yeah. So I've rambled enough, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Desiree and Carly. And I think everything you've, even in that brief intro was <clears throat> really expressed, you know, values around determination and experimentation and openness. And I think uh, the participants here will be particularly interested in uh, how you negotiated the, uh, the resistance that you encountered. So I will now hand over to Ash from Union of SA who will uh, yeah, unpack some of those themes more with um, both the two of you and Claire Thorpe as well. Yeah. Go for it, Ash. Thank you. Um, 
Desiree, you you talked about those um, academics who had or coordinators who had the um, the exception cases, um, and I am wondering how how did you get past that, or did you get past that? Um, we we pretty much got so we ha we probably have a slightly different view. My goal was to have it free for students, <laughs> um, whereas the ultimate goal is going to be all OERs, right? So you know that there's a distinction there. So my goal was the student focused um, achievement, which I. I guess is you know a precursor to the the grand achievement uh, which is on its way um so yes we have as carly's alluded to one of our um third year and and it was mostly third year units I'll, I'll say you know so the more advanced topics um you know i think to everything's moving right so i think the the issues that we had, you know, two years ago, maybe even less now. Um, I think as, well, as I'm so optimistic, as universities <laughs> support academic staff to write OERs um, in some way, anyway, would be good, um, then that, that problem's going to shrink. But at, at the moment, you know, that it is the broader ones, um, you know, the, the sort of more introductory texts that are easier. So there were some, there, there have been some smoke and mirror things like, you know, we'll use one chapter from that textbook and one chapter. There's a couple of units that are still doing that. Um, but mostly um, uh, with support from the library and we we haven't so well, I don't think we've alluded quite strongly enough to the fact that the entire university is moving this way you know Claire can talk to the the fact that you know this is this is becoming policy in the university that sort of kicking in a year or so ago started to further I don't know if incentivize is the right word, but uh, encourage, um, support the the sort of little bit of pressure that I was applying to those uh, most resistant to, to find some alternatives. And it does take some time and it is a little more work initially, but you generally can find alternatives, even if it's a little bit more of a mosaic, you know, but I personally adore the loss of the monolithic text the single voice it's just to me it's an it's abhorrent actually and it's definitely not representative of the the world that that we live in and, and the world that our graduates are going to come out and work in I love the word mosaic for that that's a perfect description <laughs> um Claire, I would like to actually ask you about policy. Um, that was a nice segue. Thank you, Desiree. Um, because, yeah, that is something that we see is that these um, these initiatives are most successful when you do have it in policy explicitly. Um, could you talk a bit about that, please? Sure. Um, so what Desiree hasn't mentioned is at the time that she was um, leading this change within the faculties, we had a, a wider institutional change going on at the same time, which uh, means that we've moved to a, a new radical way of, of teaching and learning here at Southern Cross called the Southern Cross Model, which is uh, moves away from your traditional semester lecture-based facilitation to six-week immersive blocks of teaching. So students do a full-time load of two units every six weeks. As a result of that, all the policies and procedures related to teaching and learning were reviewed and revised. And I was um, fortunate enough that when I arrived at Southern Cross, I sort of arrived in the middle of conversations that were already in train between the library and our PVCs who have responsibility for these policies and procedures. And so I inherited some, some really wonderful conversations and a commitment to really rethinking the way that scholarly information is used in the context of the Southern Cross model and really the, the impact of cognitive load on students as they're learning and being really cognizant of that uh, around um, setting students up to succeed and to, to really in, um, invest in the student experience. 
So what we were able to do was to add a number of clauses to the assessment teaching and learning procedure. So um, the way our, our, our governance is we have policy and then we have supporting procedures. And within that procedure, uh, we have a really explicit commitment to open education as our first priority over other types of content. And we have a strong, um, so, so it actually explicitly says, and I'll read this verbatim, the university promotes the adoption of open educational resources as the preferred option to prescribe textbooks. So we've got that, that mandate um, and that really clear statement of support. The procedure then goes on to say um, that there's a number of, I guess, hurdles that academics do need to, I guess, consider, or not hurdles, but, but things they need to consider if they are making a case that a textbook is required. So textbooks really are positioned as the exception of the rule. And if they want to use a textbook, they do actually need to get the approval of their Associate Dean of Education for their faculty or college. Um, there are the exceptions can be if it's required because of external accreditation purposes um, or there's no suitable open education resources. Um, but as I said, it, the way that we um, engage and, and our purpose at Southern Cross is to change lives through revolutionary learning and research with real impact. And if we're going to be serious about revolutionary approaches to learning, then using um, what I would consider potentially older ways of, of learning through a prescribed textbook in a unit, that doesn't really fit with the way we do things now. And I think you know what Desiree has demonstrated is you don't have to do things the way you've always done them. And you can take new approaches that are student-centered uh, using open and other curated subscribed content that the library has access to, to remove those financial barriers that prevent students from succeeding and from really going on to achieve the goals that they've set for themselves. Thank you, Claire. That's um, a lot of really useful information. I love that there is that explicit um, statement in there that OER are the preferred resource um, as, you know, the number one thing in there that um, I imagine is having an impact. Um, when did that come into effect? So, oh gosh, I believe that procedure was enacted at the end of 2021. Okay. Um, so yeah, so it's been there for a while. And look, I'll be really honest, um, it's difficult to evaluate the impact of that across the institution. Um, we've been having conversations in the library over the last few months around how do we actually um, count or measure the impact of which units are using open education resources. Now, some we have visibility over if the open education resource is listed in our unit management system as the equivalent of the prescribed textbook. But for many of our units, because what we have seen is, is a strong move away from documentary evidence of prescribed textbooks, um, we suspect that there are other open education or non-paid um, uh, uh, textbook approaches being used across the university. Um, but it, it is more difficult to, I guess, quantify and evaluate. So in the library, we obviously have visibility over where we've had to um, purchase prescribed textbooks because they're listed in unit outlines, or we can see that an, an OER is listed in the unit outline as an alternative. We can see where people have asked us to curate reading lists through our reading list management system. But there's probably other things that are being used within, um, we use the Blackboard uh, course management system that, that we don't have visibility over. And I think the other piece of the puzzle, and, and I'm kind of bringing this as my, my other sort of, I guess, background as an evidence-based practitioner, is, you know, Desiree mentioned earlier you know, some academics making the, the blanket case that perhaps their units aren't better than they were in this new way of, of using um, in, uh, prescribed learning resources that are not textbooks. But we probably we, what we haven't done, and, and I'm sure Desiree will be keen to do this perhaps, um, is really evaluate the student experience and look at those student uh, unit survey results perhaps to see has it made a difference? 
it, it will be hard to correlate because we've had such a significant transformation of our teaching and learning experience at the same time. So we can't just point to it and go, well, it was the removal of the textbook that improved retention and student outcomes. But it's possibly one factor and, and there are ways that perhaps that we need to interrogate that and, and research that to, to really see, um, you know, to tell that story and to really evaluate this properly. So we've got some challenges still ahead of us and some, some jobs perhaps to do on our wishes. Um, we, just, sorry, yeah, go ahead. can I add to that comment from um, Claire? Um, because the other aspect is you might, you, you achieve this outcome under somebody like Desiree, but there's the potential for cultural backsliding always. Um, and that's already come up as an issue. So let's be very real about that. Um, there's um, There's already been some unit assessors who um, have have sort of really sort of pushed for texts that are commercial texts. Um, and it kind of makes me think that you, you definitely need that course coordinator overview and advocacy going on because if there's little pockets going here and there, you then they, you then just lose your 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 Z degree, Z, you know, um, zero textbook sort of badge. Um, so it's sort of like a it's something to be constantly vigilant about really um, and I guess maybe I'm just riffing now but I'm thinking that if we manage to get those public domain pages for prospective students stamped with Z degree or or you know zero textbook cost that becomes another compelling force that that this is what our program's about this is what we do so I think it's a it's a constant um process and and while we've had um the the sort of um situation where yeah we've shifted to six-week units and that makes a really compelling case because you can't expect students to easily purchase a a, a 300 textbook for six weeks um so there's a really good argument in there but i, I feel like it's um it's just something that needs um constant watering to keep keep it sort of going um, and, and proactive engagement and, and, and conversation. Yes, there's always more to do. <laughs> and um, that with the stamping the degrees, like, you know, flagging to the students before they even enroll that this is a ZTC, um, there is, you know, evidence to show that that works, um, at least in the US. And they have, um, there's an open textbook published about how to do that, actually, in various systems. Um, we can probably put the link in the chat uh, for that too. Um, and Carly, I guess on that um, talk of the cultural backsliding, um, you spoke about earlier about learning different advocacy techniques um, when you were uh, at QLOC and listening to the um, American speaker there as well. Um, were any of those particularly useful in your institution? And uh, do you think that maybe your advocacy efforts might change now that we're not in the early phases of COVID anymore and maybe the digital argument mm. is not quite as strong? It's a really good question. I think I'm just thinking about what I took away from that institute in terms of strategies. And I think the thing that stuck, it's really sort of um, sort of popped out at me was um, I remember, I, I can't remember the guy's name. I don't know if you can help me, Claire, but the... Um, the Open Textbook Library, um, he was one of the sort of initiators or um, Dave Ernst. Dave yeah. Ernst, yeah. He, he said something like, um, you know, academics are the, he, he, he said academics are the, are the content experts. They're, the, they're, they're across the unit learning outcomes. You always need to have that in that conversation really clear um, and aware of you, you gently plant seeds you know, you there might not be there might be a lot of resistance, um, but you just gently plant seeds about about precedents where it's worked or you know what are what are the learning benefits, what are the um, what are the access benefits. You just keep planting the seeds and not in a not in a sort of um, a shaming way. You're not doing this. You're not on board with what I'm all about. Um, 
that's the quickest way to sort of get people offside because then it becomes this sort of sort of I guess smug zealotry or something. I don't know what the word would be to use for that. Um, because we aren't, you know, as librarians, we aren't content experts. We don't know what's best for a unit learning outcome. Um, but I think it's about being really realistic about your strategy um, and, and knowing that there won't be an OER for every single unit, but there might be an alternative approach around that that gets around it. So you digitise some Australian content you um, within copyright law, you, um, you, you might have part of an OER and then other journal articles. So have some different ideas. Don't be too sort of... Um, Exactly, Desiree. It's not adversarial. You know, we're all here to sort of um, support the teaching and learning of the university. Um, and that's that, I think, just your sort of integrity of why you're doing it, keeping that in mind when you're doing it, um, is is helps to sort of inform your approach. Um, I know that doesn't sound very practical, but <laughs> I feel like that comes through in your conversations with people. Yeah, being genuine and authentic with them, not trying to sell a dream that doesn't quite exist yet. Exactly. And knowing that they are the content experts, you don't know more than them about the content. You, you always need to know that. It's not about sort of a hierarchical sort of relationship it's more that that's their passion space that's what they have worked on and you work with them to find some sort of alternative resource mm. brilliant thank you um Stephen did you want to move into the q and I can see there's a lot going on in the chat at the moment so we may have audience members who would like to ask some questions yep sure um so yep Anyone can ask a question now, so feel free to either type it into the chat or turn on your microphone. Is there an issue of um, incentives for people to write these textbooks um, as opposed to, say, journal articles and things that might get them a higher career rating? Is that one of the major disincentives that people have putting the time into these textbooks? I think it is. Um, you know, we've got really excellent expertise in a couple of pockets um, where that there isn't, you know, an open text. And, you know, the, these are people publishing at the top of their field. You know, it, it has been a busy, busy time at Southern Cross as well, completely, you know, um, implementing a brand new model of education every single unit uh, we have rewritten in the last 12 months. And so it, it, I think there's an attraction toward doing that as well. So I think that as you know, as it's more and more recognised and incentivised in some way through, you know, acknowledgement of the, that, the value and potential impact of that kind of contribution, I think that'll, that will definitely make a difference. I can see a question in the chat as well from uh, Jenny asking if any of these UAs are contemplating uh, writing an OER now. I'll let Desiree speak to that because that's not, we've been really in the adoption space within, because we have been focusing on the Southern Cross model and, and transitioning to that new model. Um, I haven't had a lot of conversations around this. I have mentioned adapting texts to quite a few UAs, but I, I'm pretty sure there's that, that sort of perception that adapting texts um, um, can be such work in terms of the in terms of like the interoperability of the platforms and the and the um, content and trying to adapt that content that you know creating them might be might be might be a better option for some academics but I'm not sure what do you think Desiree? Well, I think we're getting to the crux of the issue right now, um, and and um, yeah, so I I jokingly put a response to that that 
in the chat window to say, I think they're in the pre-contemplation phase rather than actually contemplating sitting down tomorrow and, and writing these things. But, um, you know, as, as the word mosaic, you know, resonated at least with, with Ash, <laughs> um, I think that could be the way. But then I, I thought so much about different models and, you know, cont just because you're an expert in one area doesn't mean you you write across that and can write some big textbook and then, you know, sort of co co coordinating uh, a bunch of authors is a big ask. So I think that's mm -hmm. the crux of the, the next the next challenges we need to meet. I think are going to be around that kind of thing. How how to facilitate the the production of these, especially uh, above entry level kind of. Um, resources mm -hmm. and we need to be creative about that I haven't had any brilliant ideas yet no but... and I think and, and Desiree you would you would probably agree with me that we've just a lot of the academics I know this particular year because the faculty of health was the final year to roll out the academic model and it's been work in terms of workflow a really intense year for academics in the faculty of health particularly um seeing how these units roll out um, with some really high cohorts of students as well. So I haven't even dared, to be honest, I haven't even dared mention it. I have. To some people because I just feel, yeah, and maybe Claire, I need to be braver about Claire's it. But got, Claire's yeah. going to jump in and, <laughs> and fix well, this clip. Yeah, I, totally. I don't, oh, look, I'm not going to fix it. I, I wanted to, I guess, um, just sort of highlight a couple of things. One, we're a very small institution um, in the Australian landscape. And, and unlike sort of other academic libraries around the country, you know, I don't have the resources to have, say, an open education librarian, someone working on this full time. Um, in the library, we have partnered with um, some colleagues of Desiree's in the Faculty of Health in the nursing area. And that um, group of authors has been working on a original um, created open education textbook in nursing, which will be a, a fantastic series of community-based case studies that will launch um, towards the end of October, early November. And that's been a, a massive learning curve uh, for those authors and also for us in the library to, to partner with them and to support them through that process. And we're going to have to have a, a really um, good reflective time after the launch of that um, to really see whether as a smaller institution whether that is something that we can support going forward if we have the capacity or whether we are better off actually uh, focusing and partnering with academics more in that adoption and adaption space or looking at you know not replacing like for like not replacing a commercial textbook with an open textbook but replacing you know, an open textbook with a whole suite of curated materials from all sorts of different ways, places and shapes in different formats. You know, I think the, the whole idea of you just need an open textbook to replace a commercial textbook is not necessarily right in 2023. The format of the book has changed and the format of the way that we teach in the post-pandemic environment, you know, it's, it's not a necessarily a like-for-like -like replacement. So I think there are some, you know, some really careful conversations that we need to have both with um, our different um, work units across the university with the academics themselves about what they need, what they have capacity for, what's going to best fit the student learning experience and what we in the library can support as well. So it's not just a we should be writing more open textbooks easy answer. It's much more complex and nuanced than that and will be different for different faculties and disciplines and um, content. Excellent, Claire. I, I agree with all of that. And um, I think also it needs to be coordinated nationally as well as part of that core program to, to cover, you know, cover those kind of key core units within an undergraduate program. So that that's sort of happening within the core program, I'm pretty sure, Claire, where they are assessing the mix of titles across disciplines or the is my understanding if anyone else wants to jump in around that. Um, but I think that's um this is a bit we don't we're not sure if if anyone if any of the universities are doing this either. I don't 
know if anyone in this space can say whether or not that's happening at other institutions, but it certainly must be one of the first. So if anyone can shed light on that, that would be great because I, I, I'm not, I, I know that Western Sydney had zero um, textbook cost um, programs, but I'm not sure about the psychology program. So if anyone wants to chime in about that, that would be something we could learn off of attendees. There must be some mind reading happening in the room because the chat was going off about the national level stuff exactly at the same time you said it. <laughs> um, so that's clearly a factor. I um, just want to raise a question uh, entered by Elizabeth Clancy. Do you feel that the OERs that have been implemented are delivering the quality at the same level currently? And maybe if I can just slightly add to that, are there any barriers in, in those OER that, that have come up in conversations? Um, I reckon, Desiree, I wouldn't know how to answer that question yeah. at this point. I, I, I was avoiding it, hoping somebody else would think <laughs> because there is well, no unified answer to that question. I think uh, I think a lot of our team are incredibly happy um, with their units right now. You know, I think that they're very proud of um, what's been put together. And again, I'll say this is... This has all coincided with the reworking of everything in the new Southern Cross model. So, you know, again, it's it's sort of hard to tease things apart. Um, these things happened in in concert, and I think many of our um, unit assessors or subject coordinators are are very happy and very proud, and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I still think there's one or two that think, hmm. I needed to, you know, grab that chapter from there and that chapter from there and that chapter from there and kind of surf that copyright wave to its maximum um, and, and and would rather have something a bit more coherent or, or a few things a bit more coherent. So I, I think there's not a, a uniform answer to that, Stephen. I think also another way to look at the quality of OER question is, I mean, what makes a commercial book quality? You've got a content expert, you've got peer review, you've um, you've got peers in the field using it in their courses. You just have someone else hitting publish. So OER has all of that too. So I think um, when you reframe what makes something quality and then match that up with the OER, Um, Catherine Doty also asked a question about peer review or raised this idea. Catherine, did you want to speak to that at all? or well, uh, Maybe I'll read it out then. Is that... Yeah, uh, Catherine raised, if peer review of a new OER from another expert known and respected in the discipline uh, is done, this could be used to promote promote them and academics may take notice of it, which sort of links to a theme that um, our speaker from last month's webinar talked about in this idea, Plan E for Education, that universities should incentivize peer review for OER as a system of quality um, and, and support for development of, of OER. So if anyone has thoughts yeah. on that. So Stephen, the, the nursing textbook that we're, we're working to support um, is currently in peer review. So that's um, happening before we actually uh, do publish it in the, the not too distant future. Um, I think uh, there were some other sort of questions and things that came up earlier around sort of incentivising. The other thing that has happened at Southern Cross um, recently is some changes to our academic promotion policy and framework, which um, does give emphasis to scholarship of learning and teaching activities alongside research activities. And uh, there's another sort of project and body of work that I'm involved in 
uh, which is looking at, at ways of um, increasing and building capacity and that scholarship of learning and teaching and um, reporting and, and capturing that well. So I think, you know, we've sort of got multiple environmental uh, things happening in the institution in the teaching and learning space, which will, uh, which are setting us up to continue to grow and mature in this space. And I think we're, we're at the big, I feel like we're the, at the beginning of a journey rather than the midway point. Um, and I'm really, really grateful for the work that Desiree has done leading and, and, and setting, you know, a fantastic example of, of what can be done in one degree program. And you know, hopefully we'll, we'll find other champions across the institution who are interested in, in doing similar across their degree programs or even at the unit level. So I guess it's a, a watch this space advertisement. And thanks, Carly, for posting the shiny story version. Uh, it's good to have something public out there that we can share with colleagues. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, you can find the link in the chat. Elizabeth has also asked a question about, um, about interactive OER. Are there, you know, multimedia-ish type of open resources that have been used in, in, in the course without necessarily reverting to YouTube or is it all kind of traditional textual stuff? That's a really good question because oh, that's, I I'll let Desiree talk to, talk to that. Well, sorry, we can just both talk. Yeah. Again. Neither of us are, share, are, are very sure. Um, mm -hmm. I've definitely played with um, not actually open where there's a small charge, you know, so resources that have interactive, um, but also part of the Southern Cross model um, is to integrate to the unit content um, activities and that kind of thing. So we're embedding them. So that is a great advantage to students. They they sit there in their unit content. You know, we're, we're creating our own with H5P and other, you know, um, technologies. So I think that we, we've increased the interactivity of our units and course. Um, I'm not sure to what extent that includes OER type resources though. Nothing to add to that. I just that it it's the sort of foundation of the model that we're working in in terms of the ideal of what the model is is to to include interactive um, content um, throughout the units. So, um, but but because we're su at such early days, it's a bit like what Claire mentioned before and Desiree mentioned before in terms of capturing the outcomes of that or how widespread it is, we're still so early on in our in our shift to this model. Um, and it's certainly, but it's certainly it's certainly connected to um the success, I, I think, that the the rollout of this zero textbook. It's 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 there was this opportunity to sort of shift and change things. So it, it's part of the story. Thanks, everyone. We've got uh, a couple of minutes left, so maybe just one last uh, quick question. Maybe if you can pick one or two hot tips you want to leave for participants who want to follow in your footsteps before we wrap up. I think that my biggest hot tip is ensure that your goal is clearly articulated and your reasons for that. Um, you know, I think the equity and representation are two aspects of a move away from what I keep calling the monolithic textbook that they're, they're quite um, quite persuasive arguments. So if you keep your eye on that, you know, that sort of in, inspirational or aspirational point, um, then you can keep keep hitting people over the head with it when they start to go, no, this is getting hard, <laughs> maybe. But then I just might be brutal. I don't know. <laughs> um, my hot tip is to when you're first wading into advocacy work um, in the OER space is to um, sort of cut your teeth on doing that advocacy work with someone like Desiree. So 
look for people that you want to work with, that you get along with, that you want to collaborate with first to sort of sort of build that confidence as a librarian in speaking to academics. Um, I think that's really, um, it's, it's confidence building and I think that's part of, um, you know, when you're a librarian and you're kind of coming to an academic with this new idea, it can be really intimidating to, to make that pitch. Um, there are established hierarchies, you know, between professional and academic staff and, and coming with a new idea or, 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 you know, an idea that in this case was already sort of being put into practice without the sort of the, the idea of it being sort of a, a global movement. Um, I think that's, that's a really important sort of um, first step. And just coming from a place of authenticity in terms of um, why why you think it's important to do what you're doing, I think that will guide everything you do. Um, and um, that's it, really, from me. Yeah. You got a hot tip, Claire? Or <laughs> oh, look, I think you know, just to echo what Carly said: find your champions, find fabulous people like Desiree to work with, um, employ fabulous librarians like Carly, who are ready to, to get out there and give it a go. I think it, just start, for, certainly from my perspective as a, a director of the library, my role is really to, to be um, engaging, influencing and advocating at that slightly higher level. So in that policy procedure, that executive support space, so that's what I try and do, um, but also to make sure that the you know we're providing the resourcing so that we can partner successfully. Um, so yeah, look, get good people around you. It makes it a lot easier, but you know, give it a go. Um, tell your story. Share the, the bits that don't work. Um, as Stephen said, this is a really fabulous community. I'm very grateful that we've had the opportunity to come and, and share our story today. Well, if you can all uh, put your hand, your digital hands together for Carly, Desiree and Claire and thank them for their contributions today. It's been awesome. And it, I think this is a record-breaking crowd for an OEP SIG event, so that's amazing. <clears throat> Just before we finish, um, just want to share that next month we're taking a break from webinars because there will be a lot else happening and it because it's open access week in late October so have a look at the uh, open access Australasia website there is an emerging program of events that you can already register and I'm sure more will be added in the coming weeks so see you at open access week um, and again thanks you thank you to our panelists and I'll stop the recording now. Thanks, Stephen, Ash, 